I was a binger in high school, like many people in our alcohol-obsessed culture. And I binged more in college. Gradually, the days between binging started to shorten. And I started drinking, you know, instead of every Friday and Saturday, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then Thursdays, Tangeray, Tuesdays. Whenever there was an occasion to drink, I would drink. And I had a higher tolerance than any of my friends. I had parents who have been very supportive. I'm the luckiest guy ever, but they are the take it or leave it types. You know, never had any issues with alcohol. So long story short, I ultimately started working on Wall Street and then we're going out and getting bottle service. I didn't even want to go, but I end up doing that and I get to a fifth a night. I have my bottle of wine a night phase, then it's two, then it's three. Then I decide that wine has too much sugar. I should probably drink vodka instead. And uh, so I switched to that. By the time I quit drinking, I was drinking a handle of vodka every single day, keeping it in the fridge. The last job that I got hired for in finance, I drink, I drank a fifth right before the interview. And so for me, alcohol was like a missing link. It was the thing that I needed in order to relax, in order to be positive, in order to be nice to people, in order to give people gifts on Christmas morning without my hands shaking. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit of that. Ultimately, I went to a place that was very uh, compassionate. There were great people in the detox place and the uh, rehab center, but I needed something more physical because I was just feeling horrendous. So I promise this is not an excuse to mass send a shirtless selfie, but it's the best way that I can kind of convey, you know, the picture says a thousand words, uh, the transformation that I had, and I'm far from perfect, believe me, but you can see, I'm gonna try to use my laser right there. When I quit drinking, my best friends, who didn't see me for about three months, because I was in detox and rehab and then in a, you know, doing my own thing, they said, Chris, your face is like a third of the size that it was when you were drinking. Like, what the hell? Maybe we should all quit drinking. They had no idea how much I had been drinking before, because I would drink with them and then I'd also drink in private. So this picture was taken when I was 25. That was probably the peak of my drinking. Um, you know, I'm drinking out. I'm sure I'm celebrating here. But in order to feel any kind of pleasure at that stage in my life, I had to triple or quadruple the amount that I drank. No one else had any idea how much I was actually drinking. This picture I took a few, I think maybe two months ago after a workout. I am, I'm around 205 pounds right now. I think I'm about 250 in this picture. And not to, it's obviously quitting drinking is not about weight loss, but I was miserable. I felt like crap. A lot of it I think was inflammation. It's not just fat. You're retaining water all the time. My gut was a disaster. My liver was a disaster. Um, I, I had foggy brain all the time. And of course I had told myself even back then, like, oh, I'm gonna get it together. I'm gonna lose weight. I'm going to get in shape. I'd always wanted to train with a uh, former UFC fighter. I didn't want to fight myself. I didn't want to lose my brain cells, but that was a goal. And so now I can say, um, even though I'm not perfect, I do train several times a week with a retired UFC guy who lost to the guy who lost to Conor McGregor. So he's pretty good still. Um, he whoops my ass. He's about this tall and it's like trying to spar with a rabid mongoose or something. But anyway, I can now, my resting heart rate is about 47. On that, in that workout, I got it to, I got my heart rate to about 196 for almost 10 minutes straight. So I feel a lot better physically than I did back then, and we'll discuss a little bit why that's important. I use a model that I call the hierarchy of recovery with my clients, and I didn't invent this, nor did I invent the science that we'll talk about of nutrient repair. It's an adaptation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which you know, it kind of explores what are the fundamental things and in what order that people need in order to survive and thrive. And it's also an adaptation of the biopsychosocial spiritual model used by uh, Dr. Amen, who is a psychiatrist who uses brain scans and often uh, supplementations, uh, various strategies that are deemed holistic. He's a bit controversial, but he has really good results working with people who have been deemed too badly damaged you know, mentally, behaviorally to be helped. So today we'll be talking about the biochemical pillar. If I had 12 hours to talk, we would cover the rest of these. And of course there are different lenses to look through recovery. So I want everyone to remember that this is the lens I look at recovery through. This is 
how I view my own personal recovery. It's helped a lot of people. There are different angles to look at it. I see recovery as an open-ended adventure, and the more tools you have, the better. And all I can say with certainty is that, at least for me, being a really heavy drinker, nutrient repair, stabilizing my biochemistry made everything so much easier because when you feel better, you can finally summon the optimism and courage and energy and ability to relax the physical states that you need that you may have been looking for from alcohol. Once you have alternatives, you rewire your brain, um, you have other ways to do it, the alcohol becomes a moot substance. And that was my goal. I didn't want to live in a state of deprivation. I didn't want to have the absence of alcohol be the centerpiece of my life, nor did I want alcohol to be the centerpiece of my life. So that's why I have transcendence at the top. For me, transcendence, I think I probably could say that I transcended alcohol about two and a half years after I quit, and that it stopped being something that was on my mind as a valid option. It started being like about as desirable as drinking gas out of the pump when I went to a gas station. And that's, if, if I can help people get there in conjunction with existing strategies, that's my goal. I think that a lot of people who are addicted to alcohol honestly want to quit. It wasn't my experience when I relapsed hundreds of times before treatment, nor has it been the experience of most of my clients who have told me, like Chris, I've been to 12 rehabs or 13 rehabs that were lacking in the honesty department. I think that most people have a problem whereby alcohol is necessary to modulate certain chemicals in their bodies that they may not even be aware of, and that the states which they're trying to achieve physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, that they're using alcohol for are not optional luxuries. They are necessities. So we often think of, well, it would be nice if I could relax. No, you, you need to be able to relax. You need to have a certain amount of joy in your life. By the time I quit drinking, you know, I'd reached rock bottom where alcohol no longer gave me any pleasure. Um, and that's why ultimately I quit. But for a long time, the idea of living without the uh, baseline amount of uh, well-being that I got from alcohol, which is probably a negative two out of 10. At least if I drank, I got to a negative one, right? And so now, the, one of the reasons alcohol is a mood substance for me is that my sense of well-being is usually somewhere between a six and a 10 most of the time. But even when I was drinking before, it was like a negative two, negative one, it was really bad. And I could drink and maybe get it up one notch. So this is why I think of alcohol as a missing puzzle piece. And I think a good way to understand the situation is to think of it as something that boosts neurotransmitters and feel good chemicals, uh, to put it in a somewhat oversimplified way, in the short term, and in the long term, it depletes those chemicals. So we'll talk about how it does that for four important neurotransmitters. So the key neurotransmitters, there are others. Again, anytime we talk about biochemistry, nutrients, alcohol, which is a very complex drug, we're talking about cascades of different effects. So GABA, uh, dopamine, endorphins, and serotonin are really the, if you can stabilize your levels of these feel-good neurotransmitters, you will start to feel a bit better. You'll find that your ability to uh, maintain a sense of well-being that's acceptable to you without alcohol will increase. So GABA is the primary calming neurotransmitter. Ethanol molecules are very similar in structure to GABA. They plug right into the receptors. Over time, if you're drinking regularly, your brain turns down the dial on the natural production of GABA. You end up with a GABA deficiency. It's also been my experience that a lot of people attracted to alcohol in the first place possibly have a deficiency in GABA that has, could be lifelong. I think that was probably the case for me. To this day, I have to do a bunch of things that some people might find annoying, I find them fun, but like yoga, sauna, cold pool, CBD, probably, you know, magnesium supplementation to keep my GABA at a normal level because I'm naturally just a bit on edge. There are benefits to that. So every time there's something wrong, there's a, there's a benefit. My mind runs quickly, which can be helpful, um, but also not. Dopamine is also uh, something that gets depleted in heavy drinkers. I was drinking 15 cups of coffee a day after I quit drinking. I'm not a scientist, but that looks like dopamine deficiency to me. So we'll talk a bit more about the relevance of dopamine, what you can do about that. Uh, endorphins, endorphin deficiency syndrome or EDS is really common for people who quit alcohol. It's usually associated with people who quit 
uh, opiates, because endorphins are our internal opiates. But alcohol also releases endorphins, and over time, you end up with an endorphin deficiency. You might feel fragile. You might feel like you're less resilient in the face of pain. You might have anhedonia, uh, which means pleasure deafness. So you might have a lot of trouble feeling good when there are things that intellectually you know should make you feel good. That can also be due to dopamine deficiency. Finally, serotonin. Um, alcohol does cause a release of serotonin. Uh, I think of it as the relaxation and confidence chemical. And we'll talk about some ways to increase all of these neurotransmitters naturally. I wanna talk a little bit more about what's going on when you drink and from a biochemical lens, because it's not talked about often. Um, inflammation is, it's become a buzzword now, but in the context of alcohol, you know, I, I think it's interesting to explore exactly what's going on when we have systemic inflammation due to alcohol use. So recently I had a uh, doctor, an MD and an alcohol researcher, he's been doing this for about 30 years, he's close to retirement, named Dr. Umhau. And he explained the exact process by which this systemic inflammation occurs. And basically when you're drinking alcohol too much, well, I mean, any amount is arguably too much, but let's say you're a long-term drinker, what happens is the alcohol goes down to your gut and it simultaneously damages your gut lining, causing leaky gut, which is still somewhat controversial in some medical circles, but he believes that it's a thing. And at the same time, it causes dysbiosis, which is a, uh, basically the proportion of good bacteria and bad bacteria gets thrown off. And when that happens, you end up with something called endotoxin. So these bacterial toxins that get produced in response to the alcohol in the gut go through the leaky gut, end up in the liver, where they produce inflammatory molecules called inflammatory cytokines. These inflammatory cytokines go to the brain, uh, and not to mention the liver damage that's occurring anyway from the alcohol. These inflammatory cytokines go to the brain. They actually inhibit the production of neurotransmitters like serotonin. It's been proven that inflammatory cytokines can inhibit serotonin synthesis. Um, I would guess that it has a similar effect on other important neurotransmitters. So the end result then is you have an inhibition of these feel-good chemicals. You become more deficient in them. You go out and you drink more because you feel depressed. And then of course the cycle repeats itself. So that's you know, how inflammation uh, unfolds for a lot of people. And I'm sure that was going on, me and my before pick. My gut health was a disaster. Um, I, as I said, I was foggy brained. So let's also talk about another mechanism by which you become biochemically imbalanced. Hypoglycemia is something that I would guess statistically a lot of you have experience with even if you haven't identified it. I talked to someone at a rehab center lately who said they tested for hypoglycemia. They found out that 99% of the people who had been through that center in the last year had blood sugar that got abnormally low. I think the normal range during a, a down, a dip in blood sugar is somewhere between 70 and 99 milligrams per deciliter. 99% of them were getting well below 60, close to 50. I know for a fact that I struggled with hypoglycemia. When I quit drinking, I was drinking two liters of soda every single day uh, for weeks. Putting an end to that actually helped me get rid of my alcohol cravings. Um, so when you drink alcohol or when you eat sugar, you end up with an insulin spike a few hours later. Most people know that insulin helps to reduce the blood sugar. Um, you don't want too much blood sugar, but what people don't realize is that you're also wiping out, the insulin's wiping out amino acid precursors for feel-good chemicals. So you end up with the alcohol and the sugar getting rid of, also you know, indirectly inhibiting the production of these feel-good chemicals that we need to feel good. Cross addiction to sugar, I really think it is a valid cross addiction. It's something that's not talked about that much. It's kind of accepted will extend alcohol cravings because alcohol is a highly refined sugar. The brain's number one option, if it can get it, is a very quick toxic alcohol buzz, absorbs right through the stomach, hits the brain quickly. Its second favorite thing would be sugar. And further down the list would be something like protein that, or, or fat that has to be absorbed more slowly and further along in the digestive tract. So if you're eating a lot of sugar after quitting drinking, I understand it, I've been there but there are some methods that we'll talk about to get rid of those sugar cravings and the alcohol cravings. Sleep deprivation is something that is huge and it's not talked about that often as a source of biochemical imbalances, but we restore every cell in our body when we're asleep. 
One of the best books I've read lately is a book called Why We Sleep by uh, Matthew Walker. I think he's the one of the premier sleep researchers in the U.S. And he goes into, he has a, a section of the book where he talks about alcohol and it's basically like no amount of alcohol is good for sleep. If you're gonna go to the bar at all, go in the morning and only have one drink. That's literally what he says because you don't want alcohol anywhere near your sleep. So we have another study coming out that says one glass of wine reduces recovery physiologically by 10%. So imagine what five glasses of wine will do or 10. Um, and I was doing this again and again and again to myself. Imagine a handle of vodka. I mean, I was in like a walking nightmare and I had no idea why. I just thought, oh, I got eight hours of sleep, probably fine. But alcohol is disrupting REM sleep. It's keeping you from restoring. It's, uh, it is basically a huge disaster for sleep. And I can tell you that in my sixth year alcohol free, if I wanna feel like maybe 10 to 15% of the, of the way I felt when I was withdrawing from alcohol, all I need to do is get five hours of sleep. That'll do it. That's the only thing I can do to make me feel like that. It's very important. Post-acute withdrawal, and this is all part of the catch-22, right? Because we need alcohol, at least in the absence of recovery methods. Uh, we need alcohol to feel good in the short term, but in the long term, all of this is happening. I wasn't told in the rehab center that I went to that post-acute withdrawal was an actual thing that would keep me from feeling good for up to a year after I quit drinking. I also wasn't told that um, changing my diet and making sure I got exercise, basically holistic strategies, a lot of things you'll be learning here, yoga um, and nutrient repair can shorten it down to a matter of weeks instead of months if it's properly done. Um, so people think that when they quit drinking, then they deal with acute withdrawal, then they go back to normal. And that doesn't happen. You know, as we've established, you have long-term deficiencies in GABA, dopamine, endorphins, serotonin. Um, hypoglycemia is not resolved the day that you quit drinking. It's not even resolved weeks later, unless you're very proactive. Gut inflammation is not resolved immediately. Neither is brain inflammation. So all of these things can last sometimes for years. One of the saddest things that I heard in early recovery and most discouraging to me at, at, at the time was uh, I had gone to an AA meeting, which a lot of my clients find helpful. I no longer utilize AA, but I'd gone to a meeting and someone said, I've been sober for 35 years. And she was literally shaking. I didn't know if she was afraid of speaking in front of people or what. Um, now I, I would have seen nutrient deficiencies all over her face. And she said, I, I wanna drink every single day, but I'm not gonna drink today. And you could just tell, I was like, oh my God. Like, if that's me 35 years later, I think I'd rather just drink as horrible. That was my thought at the time, like I'm going to a bar and you don't have to have post-acute withdrawal or deficiencies that are extended for a long time. And I understand also that this is really hard to grasp until you've experienced this. So if I were in your shoes listening to me, I probably wouldn't believe me. So I just said, try to keep an open mind. If you can find something that does help you feel better, then it's gonna enable you to do a lot of things. So a little recap here, long-term alcohol is the root cause of various problems, especially neurotransmitter deficiencies. Short-term alcohol use is the easiest, most satisfying, most convenient solution, but there are ways to break the cycle. There are many ways. Today, we're only talking about supplements. So nutrient repair, you want to use these compounds for about one to three months, and actually they're, there is intelligent experimentation. So I ended up taking some things for a year, other things for two weeks, based on how they made me feel. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but the basic supplements fall into uh, five categories. So you have amino acids, vitamins and minerals. I put them in the same category because they're cofactors that are necessary to turn those amino acids into usable chemicals. Fatty acids, which are necessary for repair. Uh, probiotics, which are necessary for gut health, fixing that dysbiosis. Uh, and I say evidence-based herbs because finally, we have studies showing that some of the herbs that I have loved just anecdotally for uh, the last several years are actually useful for reducing inflammation, reducing cravings, uh, et cetera. I include this here. Healthline is one of the, probably if not the, most well-regarded uh, science blog. I mean, it's basically, it's just run by doctors, and I, I thought it was a government website, I don't think it is, but they finally put out an article after years of me 
tooting this horn um, about how nutritional therapy is helping people overcome alcohol addiction. Scientists are finding that addressing nutritional deficiencies and gut bacteria health may be missing pieces of the sobriety puzzle. I wish I had had this article when I talked to a doctor six years ago about is there anything I can do? And he said, no, nothing. <laughs> he said, go to rehab. Am I going to get better? No, probably not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now we can at least, you, if you have a doctor who you like and they're skeptical about nutrient repair, there is finally more stuff bubbling up to the surface of our current zeitgeist. I, I'm going to skim through some of these a little bit because I can get sucked down rabbit holes. But this is a study um, done for Joan Matthews Larson's uh, clinic called Health Recovery Center. They, they gave, I think it was 100 alcoholic patients, 60% of whom had failed uh, one or more treatment program before. And uh, it turned out that 85% of the subjects reported themselves abstinent and stable at 12 and 42 months post-treatment. So that's pretty remarkable. That's unheard of. We have another one here uh, designed by Dr. Kenneth Blum, an early amino acid nutrient repair pioneer. And they found, you can see, there's a huge difference in the symptoms, emotional symptoms, somatic symptoms, cognitive symptoms, after getting nutrient repair. Let's see. We also have a study showing that for repeat DUI, sounds kind of rude to call them offenders. I definitely should have gotten a DUI at some point. They were given 10 weeks of two enhanced recovery formulas. After 10 months, 73% on the save were uh, recovering, or were still in recovery, and 53% on the tropamine. So I guess the save is better than the tropamine, but when you consider that the average relapse rates in most rehab centers are still around 90% or higher. I talked to a rehab center who's self-reported, they didn't publish this, but their relapse rate was 100% for the prior year, which is appalling. And it's not necessarily their fault, we just need some new ideas. This is a slide I'm gonna skim over but feel free to ask me for more studies because there are a lot of studies. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of like double blind, placebo controlled, randomized FDA backed studies because the FDA, for reasons I won't get into, has no interest in doing these kinds of studies. I think GABA is probably the most important neurotransmitter to stabilize in alcohol recovery. It's also the one that you're targeting in acute withdrawal. So benzodiazepines, if you've ever been given uh, Librium or Ativan, or uh, anything else like that in order to stabilize your symptoms in the short term, keep you from having a seizure. You're trying to balance out your GABA, which is really out of sorts after quitting drinking. So <clears throat> what can you do after that? And obviously I wanna be clear that anyone having, it doesn't appear to me that anyone here has severe withdrawal, but uh, you don't want to, you wanna make sure that you get to the ER if you have severe <laughs> withdrawal symptoms. Me coming off a handle of vodka a day, going straight to supplements, uh, probably was not as good of an idea in the short term as getting a benzodiazepine. They gave me a shot of Ativan. After about a week or so, I wish I'd known about these supplements, but there's still a, a transitional period where if you need medical attention, you should not be uh, taking supplements. With that said, I have helped people get off of, say, a liter per day of vodka uh, and taper down with the help of supplements because they were in a foreign they were in foreign countries and literally could not, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> could not get benzodiazepines. So it can be done. I think the most important amino acid is L-glutamine, and L-glutamine is a precursor for GABA. So you need L-glutamine, magnesium, and vitamin B6 in order to produce more GABA in your brain. And L-glutamine does a bunch of other things that are really cool, helps repair the gut, helps to uh, get rid of hypoglycemia. We'll get into that in a little bit. GABA is a cool supplement that actually didn't help me. There's evidence that it doesn't effectively cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, it is pure GABA, you know, just like would be in your brain, but the, it might be a little too big to cross for most people. But now after several years of not mentioning it, I mention it because too many people have told me it helps. I don't know why. I think it could be that maybe GABA plays a bigger role in the gut than we think, and it's doing something down there, and the gut-brain connection is an area of emerging research. So I do include that. It could be helpful. L-theanine is also 
something that can help you indirectly balance your GABA levels because it plugs into glutamate receptors. So glutamate is a chemical that increases electrical activity in your brain. GABA dampens it. They should exist in a balance like a seesaw. And so if your GABA is too low, your glutamate's too high. So L-theanine, which also happens to be the natural relaxing chemical in green tea, can help you turn down the dial on, glut on glutamate, get your, your, the proportion of GABA and glutamate in balance. Glycine and taurine are also really helpful for feeling calm. I know people who have megadose taurine, a lot of energy drinks have taurine to balance out the caffeine buzz. Glycine is a little bit less known, but it can help you feel at ease. And I also have pictures of yoga and meditation. I can't prove that they increase GABA levels, but I got into both and Assuming that I have a uh, deficiency in GABA that's lifelong, I can say that meditation and yoga, they help me feel how I know I feel when my GABA levels are okay. Let's talk about dopamine. So the most obvious or uh, simplest precursor for dopamine is L-tyrosine that gets converted right into dopamine in the brain. Uh, DLPA is another great amino acid that can increase dopamine levels. DLPA is a combination of two amino acids, DPA, which naturally boosts endorphin levels, and LPA. LPA is what gets turned into dopamine. LPA and uh, L-tyrosine are pretty similar. I also want to mention mecunopurines, which is also known as velvet bean. It's a natural source of L-dopa. And I took mecunopurines probably two and a half months after I quit drinking, and I stopped drinking 15 cups of coffee every day. It was kind of amazing. There was also reishi mushroom, was something I added around the same time. So I don't know exactly, you know, it's hard to disaggregate all of this, but I know the first time I took a Macuna, I was a little scared because I'd, I'd read some critical reviews of it, but also some really positive reviews of it. And it was like color slowly seeped back into my vision and I felt motivated. I actually used Macuna Purians to start writing my earliest blog articles, which are not that impressive but at least I got started um, and I wanted to do it. And I found myself sleeping better at night, which led me to the idea that maybe if you're balancing your excitatory neurotransmitters like dopamine during the day, then you're better able to shut things down at night so you don't have your brains not trying to max out dopamine uh, and screw up your circadian rhythm. And I had one more thought on uh, dopamine. I wanted to mention you know, weightlifting. I have playing chess there. People associate dopamine with seeking, learning, reward, motivation. It's also associated with addiction and cross addiction. Where I went to detox, I was basically warned to never do things that might increase my dopamine too much. The assumption being that it would lead me back to alcohol inevitably, that alcohol is my drug of choice, but I was potentially addicted to anything. Reflecting on my experience and from what I've seen, I think cross addiction is largely a symptom of an unbalanced brain. In a lot of instances it is. And what if it were, this is just a hypothesis, but what if it wasn't that I had too much dopamine that was going crazy uh, when I was drinking and in early recovery when I was drinking 15 cups of coffee and I did other things, I'd walk into Wendy's for no reason, um, you know, get ice cream in the middle of the night. What if it was that I was so deficient in dopamine that my brain was trying to max out what little dopamine I had all the time to give, my, give me the illusion, uh, the sensory illusion of normal dopamine levels. I noticed that I started acting less compulsively after I started taking these compounds, which I find interesting and I see that in a lot of my clients as well. So things like lifting and anything that gets you passionately going. I mean, chess is not my favorite thing. I tend to lose to people who are smarter than me, but anything that's like a puzzle or anything, you know, fit recovery really, building my blog was my puzzle to figure out. I needed to feel like I was doing something. I needed to start generating those new dopamine-laced pathways that would eventually help me make alcohol a moot substance. There aren't that many supplements that directly affect endorphins, at least not that I know of. DLPA, which we already discussed, is one way to do it. That's I took one capsule of DLPA every day for a year because I was very anhedonic. I, I was pleasure deaf. DLPA helped me. Why did I take it for a year? Because I tried to stop taking it several times and I felt uh, kind of a return to the, a little bit of color seeped out. But by the time I quit taking DLPA, it was making me a little bit edgy. 
So that's actually, if you read uh, someone who writes about these amino acids often is, is Julia Ross. And she'll say, with things like DLPA, you reach a point where you know you don't need it because it's not giving you the desired effect anymore. So a lot of people ask me, you know, am I gonna get addicted to or hooked on amino acids? I, I've thought about that a lot. I don't see why it would be theoretically impossible, but I've never heard of it happening. It definitely didn't happen to me. And if anything, I hear people, my clients will say, you know, I stopped taking the DLPA because uh, it, it's making me too wired in the morning. Or I stopped taking 5-HTP because it started, and we haven't talked about that yet, that's a serotonin precursor. It started keeping me up instead of helping me go to sleep. And interestingly, the symptom of excess serotonin is almost identical to the symptom of too little serotonin. So that's how you would know uh, whether you've had too much and it's time to stop taking it. So it's as simple as that. You monitor how you feel. You take things, I think, at, at reasonable dosages. I always started with the label dosages. And then you stop and see what happens. As far as endorphins go, I include a sauna, a boxing workout, and some cryotherapy. I like a cold pool better if I can find a 49 or 48 degree pool. Uh, that's my preferred route. But I had a client once who was very anhedonic. He couldn't get DLPA because he lived in a country in the Middle East. The only thing he could do was get really hot or take a cold shower while he waited for his friend to basically smuggle uh, supplements into the country. And he was able to use hot and cold exposure to make life at least livable for about a week and he was coming off of a liter of vodka per day. He was able to taper down with the help of hot exposure and really cold showers, which I found interesting. I know we talked a little bit about 5-HTP. 5-HTP and, and L-tryptophan are the two main amino acid precursors for serotonin. Um, SAMe is also an amino acid derivative that can increase serotonin levels, also increases dopamine and norepinephrine levels has a couple other effects, really good for depression. Most people associate serotonin with depression, and I've actually seen a lot of people who are simultaneously addicted to alcohol and on antidepressants, which says to me that antidepressants are not a good way to keep yourself off of alcohol. It's like literally 30 to 40% of people who join my course uh, or who sign up as clients are on antidepressants, usually SSRIs. And if you're on an SSRI, you want to be very cautious about 5-HTP, L-tryptophan, or SAMe because you don't wanna to have too much serotonin in your brain. The SSRI is concentrating serotonin between synapses. These are raising your natural levels and uh, you don't want serotonin syndrome. With that said, uh, there are other supplements that you can take. Uh, if you avoid these three and you're on an SSRI and you take the others, experiment with the others that I've discussed, you'll probably you know, have better results. And with that said, some people have used any of the, these three supplements to wean off of antidepressants, SSRIs, but you wanna be under the care of a doctor who understands the dosage. Um, so they can be really helpful, but you don't wanna go taking them if you don't know what you're doing. D3 is very important for serotonin synthesis and lithium orotate, something that sounds scarier than it is. It's a, basically a microdose of elemental lithium. A, a very tiny amount of the, you're probably thinking of the mega doses that we sometimes give to people with bipolar or whatever. I have taken lithium orotate and I would guess that it has an effect on my GABA and serotonin. If I'm in a manic state, which happens like once a year, usually too much coffee, too much going on, not enough sleep, I'll take a lithium orotate, I get 12 hours of sleep and I feel like I'm reset. I also have a picture here of exercise and people hanging out. Serotonin is an ancient modulator of social bonding along with oxytocin, uh, which we're not gonna discuss today. And also a cool thing about exercise is that when you work out, especially steady state cardio, you're actually pulling amino acids into your muscles to help with recovery. But L-tryptophan, which is the amino acid precursor of serotonin, is not needed by the muscles. It goes straight to the brain and gives you a boost of natural serotonin. So you also wanna make sure you have cofactors for nutrient repair. This just means the vitamins and minerals. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this, but B vitamins are super important. Uh, most hospitals now give shots of thiamine to anyone with a severe alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Uh, magnesium, zinc, 
chromium, vitamin C, help with detoxification, help with liver regeneration, brain regeneration. They're also involved in the synthesis of the basic, the four basic neurotransmitters we just talked about. I found that most people benefit from a B-complex and a potent multivitamin. I like one called Legion Triumph, which is a sports multivitamin. I actually have no association with them, but that's the one I use. It has very high levels of B12, B1, um, and B6. You need vitamin B6 for the synthesis of all of the uh, neurotransmitters we just discussed. So to reduce inflammation, we talked a little bit about neurotransmitters per se, but you wanna make sure that you get omega-3s, which are very important for uh, Dr. Umhau in the podcast episode he was on talks about how people who took omega-3s had reduced inflammation in the liver and in the gut and, and in the brain. And so I think it was a study that he had done personally with homeless people who were addicted to alcohol, who were just given omega-3 tablets uh, or capsules, were, had much lower rates of relapse than the people who did not get that. Uh, high potency CBD, is something I could talk about for a long time. It's a buzzword now, which is unfortunate because there are a bunch of valid studies that are showing its usefulness for reducing inflammation and um, reducing relapse even. Everything from nicotine to morphine to cocaine to amphetamines to alcohol, CBD seems to lower relapse rates probably by reducing inflammation. Probiotics, we discussed that a little bit. So we wanna get rid of dysbiosis in the gut. PPC or phosphatidylcholine is very useful for anyone with very bad liver health. Um, it can actually regenerate liver cells. It's a fatty acid that's also a, uh, involved in repairing membranes of, of neurons. So brain and liver repair. Liposomal vitamin C helps to repair every cell in the body. Ashwagandha and Hervinia dulcis, which is a source of DHM. Those are probably my two favorite herbs. Those are the most evidence-based herbs that we know of now, I would argue, for alcohol recovery, since both of them not only reduce systemic inflammation, but they also can help repair organs like the liver. And they actually both have been shown to knock ethanol molecules off of GABA receptors if you try to drink. So DHM is actually the chief ingredient in a hangover cure, uh, or so-called hangover cure, called Cheers, or it used to be Thrive. Um, and it was a, they were on Shark Tank as a Princeton grad who you know, had that. And I thought, this is really cool, but also like, I want, how do we market this for alcohol recovery instead of people who now think they're invincible? DHM is not going to make you invincible uh, to alcohol. I want to mention that L-glutamine is really helpful for a lot of people with sugar cravings and alcohol cravings. And that's because L-glutamine gets converted directly into glucose in the brain without causing a corresponding insulin spike. So if you eat sugar in order to deal with an alcohol craving, you get temporary relief, you're gonna end up with an insulin spike and then you end up back in the same position, craving both sugar and alcohol most likely. If you take L-glutamine instead, you can actually take somewhere between one and 10 grams, I mean, it's a pretty benign amino acid, under the tongue and it'll get absorbed directly into your bloodstream this is the quickest hack I know to resolve a biochemical alcohol craving, a physiological one, as opposed to a psychological alcohol craving, which would be you know, a billboard you saw or your ex texting you or some trigger, which also needs to be addressed. But it's easier to address those psychological triggers when you do something about your biochemistry proactively. So we have some other things that are helpful that I'm not going to go into because we already kind of discussed them. Low sugar diet, I think, is key. I'm not doing this perfectly. I'm drinking a kombucha with 12 grams of sugar in it right now. Uh, but that's still a relatively, what's that? That's probiotic. It, but, it, but yeah, it's right. So, you know, it balances out. So some of some other herbs that help that I want to mention. I, I talked a little bit about ashwagandha and rhodiola rosea. Uh, maybe I didn't talk about rhodiola. Those are adaptogens. An adaptogen helps your stress response system rebalance. So it could give you energy or relaxation depending on what your biochemistry is missing. I do wanna say that I took uh, six tea bags of chamomile tea every night for a year after I quit drinking. I did that because I just, I, I tried it once and I felt a little bit better, I could sleep better. And then only later did I find out that chamomile tea contains a compound called apigenin, which is an anxiolytic or anti-anxiety agent and also a natural antidepressant. So I was getting a lot of that with my six tea bags, but I'm a fairly big guy, I was even bigger then. And it was just something that made me 
reframe that time of day. It became chamomile tea day or tea time rather than drink booze time. And it got so powerful, that neural pathway started growing. When I saw a movie with people drinking like wine, I was like, oh, they're drinking chamomile tea, like obviously. <laughs> so there is a subjective element to alcohol addiction and recovery. Trial and error uh, is really important here. And I know it's probably something you're wondering about, like how do I even get started? I didn't really know what I was doing when I started this. I just wanted to feel better. So as I said, like I ordered a bottle of magnesium citrate and just as a quick aside, don't get magnesium oxide. I should have said that earlier. It doesn't absorb well. There are a bunch of different bioavailable magnesiums now. And also, uh, when, I, when I got the Macuna Prurians, I had no idea what to expect. It just, I followed the dosage on the label, had a good effect. And yet for probably 20 or 30 different things I tried, it had no effect or had a bad effect and they went straight back to Amazon or wherever I got them. But I didn't want to give up because I knew that if, if there was just one compound that could make me feel a little bit physically better, that would give me, I don't know, 2%, 5%, 20% more energy to direct towards things that were actually really important. So ultimately, I found about 15 different compounds to be really helpful for me that I took for one to three months, some a little bit shorter, some a little bit longer. Oh, I do want to mention, people ask a lot about custom tests, genetic testing, gut testing, and all of that. They can be helpful, um, but in the context of alcohol recovery, we're just not quite there yet uh, to figure out ex what that means for dosages. For example, we have neurotransmitter tests that are urine tests that actually don't tell you much about what's in your brain at the moment. The blood tests, which are a little bit better. There are blood tests for magnesium that actually aren't very accurate because a lot of magnesium stored in your bones. So we're not quite there with the tests. That's something that one of the reasons I started BioRebalance with a PhD, she's actually working on her second PhD right now, is to get to that point where we can synthesize data, maybe have some kind of artificial intelligence algorithm that can get back to people and say, you need exactly this much uh, of a certain amino acid or a fatty acid, vitamin, mineral, et cetera we're not quite there yet. I prefer to start with a minimum effective dosage, figure out what that is, and then increase it as necessary or stop taking it if it uh, doesn't do anything. So basically you wanna eat less sugar, less refined carbs. I, I don't wanna tell you what to eat because everyone's different. I don't wanna go down the rabbit hole of the vegans versus carnivores and all of that stuff. <laughs> Find something that works for you. And as a general rule, try to get a lot of micronutrients, try to eat. Uh, I'm not gonna say a lot of vegetables, whatever works for you. I've seen some very bizarre things work for people in diet, which is why I don't do any general recommendations beyond try to eat things that keep you healthy, keep your inflammation low. Um, and I will say that if you have liver issues post-drinking, you wanna eat more protein because the liver requires a lot of protein in order to resynthesize, to regenerate. So that's something that you would probably be working with with a doctor anyway. Um, but if you suspect liver damage, check your protein needs. I say ancestral considerations might help. There's an interesting anecdote about people from, of Scandinavian descent. Um, and I, being adopted, had no idea what I was. Turns out I'm Scottish and Scandinavian a little bit, not that much, mostly Scottish. I do better on a diet pretty high in fish. It turns out that People from that area of the world, and this is not the only like weird anecdote I could come up with, but it's just one off the top of my head. They tended to get their omega-3s in high amounts from fish for generations and generations. And now they have very high rates of depression, probably omega-3 induced, uh, deficiency induced depression uh, and other fatty acids that they need that they're not getting when they move to Nebraska or wherever Scandinavians move. Um, and they also have very high rates of alcohol addiction, which could be due to, to depression caused by omega-3 deficiency. So it's worth, I think, even if you can't prove anything cert with certainty, looking into your ancestry, trying to figure out like, maybe there's something I should be eating based on this that could have, a, have played a role in the way I've been feeling my whole life and I didn't understand why. A lot of people want to know about when they're going to lose weight after quitting drinking. Uh, and of course, there are people addicted to alcohol who are very skinny. And a lot of those people have such bad gut damage and bad liver damage. I'm not saying everyone. So if you're skinny and you're listening to me, don't get worried. 
But uh, often with chronic you know, end stage uh, alcoholics, you get skinny because you're not absorbing anything anymore. The alcohol has done a lot of damage. Most people, including myself, tend to put on fat. And as I said earlier, some of that is inflammation weight, you know, subcutaneous water retention, which I think also is a result of chronic dehydration. Alcohol being a diuretic, you're in a dehydrated state. When you quit drinking for several weeks, your body can hang on to water. It can take time to flush it out. The nutrient repair helps because what you want to do is repair your metabolism. You want to repair your liver health. You can do that by giving yourself the raw materials you need for those to function well. Uh, Epsom salt baths can help, especially with subcutaneous water. I mean, those basically just keep not drinking and repairing yourself. And within several months, if you have weight, excess weight caused by alcohol, it's going to go away. I have to say, also don't switch from alcohol to sugar because that's the big, the big thing that keeps people from losing the weight. And I know I keep harping on sugar and diet. I eat really well about 80% of the time. 20% of the time I eat whatever the hell I want. And that's just how I, I like, I follow that 80-20 rule and it works for me. So I'm not saying don't ever, there are people actually, Joan Matthews Larson in her book, I think at some point literally said like, you can't ever eat an ice cream sundae again. I'm reading like, no, you know, <laughs> so, and I don't even like ice cream that much anymore, but if you tell me I can't have something, then I get pissed off. So after nutrient repair, we enter something I call the maintenance or optimization phase. And that's just when you're trying to keep this state of balance that you've achieved over the long term. So this is the point at which I tell you, I am not taking 15 different supplements a day. As I said, I took them for one to three months. I do take some beet powder in the morning. I used to have high blood pressure as a result of alcohol, but I wanna make sure it doesn't come back. Beet powder is a good way to control that if it's not out of control, high blood pressure. Um, and I no longer have it, by the way, but it's something I'm cognizant of. I take a greens and adaptogen powder. I take a multi-nutrient system, kind of like a multivitamin. And I take things as needed. So, you know, I'm, after a, a trip, if I am sleep deprived, I might take some magnesium or lithium orotate, maybe even a 5-HTP if I think that I'm maybe deficient in serotonin. Basically, that one to three months of experimentation provided me with tools that I can use for the rest of my life based on how I'm feeling. So I like waking up in the morning. Now, I used to hate mornings when I was a drinker because I get messages like this, and it's surreal. Uh, it's too many to count at this point, but I wanted to share just a few. Tiffany is an awesome woman who was on my podcast last week, and she has been alcohol-free for about a year. She lost 75 pounds after she quit drinking. And I can't remember exactly how much she was drinking, but um, I think it was probably in the five to eight drinks a day range, maybe, maybe 10 at some point. But she didn't use any other programs. I'm not saying that that's the right way to go for everyone, but it seems to be the case that her missing link was nutrient repair. Got this message from a guy with, uh, with a Bruce Lee picture. He ordered some of the supplements in a YouTube video that I was talking about. He said, my mind, clarity, focus, et cetera, all sharpened, reduced drink. Also, fortunately, I'm not going to the UK, but um, it's cool. Like just to hear from people anecdotally who are benefiting from this kind of thing, I really think it's increasingly part of the zeitgeist. The biggest benefit I found of nutrient repair was life in full color returning. So the best analogy, and I didn't invent this analogy, but I think it's probably the best one I've heard for reminding people who have fallen into the trap of alcohol addiction that it didn't always used to feel this black and white, is saying, remember when you were 10 years old, going to a slumber party, and you had a great time, and no one was drinking at all? Like, it's, it seems obvious when you think of it that way. Isn't it strange how we get to a point where you think, in order for life to be colorful and fun and exciting, we have to have alcohol? Like, no, if you're feeling as physically optimal as you can, you actually reach higher states of well-being than if you were uh, drinking. And I can, that's why alcohol has become a mood substance for me. You have stronger relationships when you feel physically better. I think that if you approach the irritability, restlessness, discontent issue from a biochemical angle, you stop focusing inwardly on things that are wrong with you. You stop uh, maybe blowing things out of proportion I found that when I was drinking and during withdrawal and post-acute withdrawal, I would amplify my negative emotions. 
After nutrient repair, I stopped doing that because I felt pretty chill, felt pretty positive. I mean, as positive and chill as I could be. And that led to me focusing more on other people, which also had the effect of me focusing less on alcohol, especially when I was out. I found that another benefit of this transformation is that you disengage from unhealthy norms. You start to realize that we all kind of live in an insane, uh, an insane society, not an asylum. Um, <laughs> but there are reasons for like, you start to question like, all right, if we have a society that uh, revolves around alcohol, which is irrational and toxic uh, and short-sighted and leads to a catch 22, what else could be amiss here? Like maybe we should stop being so judgmental about our uh, various issues that we have when we take into consideration things like the modern diet, which is filled with sugar and trans fats, not that everyone partakes in it, but you know, we have more compassion for coworkers who might be, I had a coworker once who, who had fawn over French fries for like three hours uh, when I worked in finance and I hated the guy. And then looking back in retrospect, I'm like, maybe he was an asshole because he was eating French fries all the time. <laughs> like, so you get a little more compassion. Um, the workplace, everyone's different. I found that I could not live in a cubicle anymore. It just wasn't gonna work. I became a personal trainer and I was happier immediately. It's the only job I've ever quit thanks to the surreal uh, process of fit recovery starting to become better known. Personal training is the only job I've ever quit that I miss. Luckily, I get a little bit of that dynamic with uh, recovery coaching. Sleep deprivation, everyone's sleep deprived all the time. People are addicted to their smartphones and social media. I'm trying to get more addicted to social media. I never post, I'm trying to start doing it. So I have the opposite problem. But we see, I mean, I do have the thing where I will take out my phone. I just got a new iPhone, I don't know why. But I'll take out my phone because I'm like, something's supposed to happen now, let's see what it is. Like it doesn't, and nothing. Like my, I have no new emails, no new text messages. There is a weird dopamine thing going on with phones and it's affecting everyone. There are no so-called normies, at least as far as I can tell. There's definitely a difference between people. There's a spectrum, right? But I think our society is currently dragging more people towards what we would call addict and less and away from the normie. When you have a transformation that starts with the biochemistry, with rebalancing yourself, it's easier to reframe alcohol. One of the reasons alcohol becomes a mood substance is that you become attached to better ways, a myriad of new ways to change your state, control how you're feeling, and achieve what you wanted to achieve from alcohol, which you now know will never happen. So I think of it, I think of alcohol as a, as a toxic suboptimal method of mind alteration. I would much rather spend half an hour in the sauna and jump in a cold pool. That probably doesn't sound fun to you now, but I sincerely mean that. Um, and it, I was drinking a handle of vodka a day. So if I can get to the point where I would honestly and genuinely prefer sitting in 150 to 200 degrees in wood, you know, in a wood room, and then jumping in a 49 degree pool, then drinking, I think it's a testament that anyone can have a similar type of mental reframe. My friends call my old, my before picture old C. I'm now new C. <laughs> old C thought I'm at a party and I have to drink, obviously. What else would I do? I am required by law. New C thinks alcohol is just a toxic thing that everyone, no one's enlightened here except me. It's a little bit arrogant, I know. Um, but apparently they all need it to get on my level. I don't even think about whether they're addicted to it or not. I just think I feel pretty good most of the time uh, and other people need this thing, which really sucks, but it's not my problem. You know, maybe I'll even get a vicarious secondhand buzz, as scandalous as that sounds, just from hanging out with them when, they, when they're poisoning themselves. But I sure as hell don't need a secondhand hangover. It's their fault, however they feel tomorrow. I'm surprised by getting to the point where being around drinkers didn't bother me at all. Like I never, I really never thought I would get to that point. And as I said, I think it was around two and a half years for me. And I could have discovered a lot of this a lot quicker. I honestly think that now is the best time ever to quit drinking. When I quit, um, I, I was working for a finance firm and basically they, I'm in detox and they called and said, your position has been eliminated, which was a nice way of saying that you're fired. And I was about ready to say, well, I don't wanna go back anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing to me how much the stigma of addiction has decreased in the last five or six years. 
And it's not perfect. Obviously, there's still stigma. But I think not only that, but the stigma has gotten better. Um, but also, you have a wellness choice of not drinking. And I wanted to mention that my dad, who quit drinking as a show of moral support for me, he was a social drinker. You know, we're not blood related. Had, he had no idea what it was like to be addicted to alcohol. I think he was yeah, late 60s when he quit and, uh, and I quit at the same time. And he was probably having two, maybe three glasses of wine, two, maybe three times a week with dinner. So that's solid, you know, social drinker. And he decided that he needed to fill his, his schedule with new things now that he wasn't going to be going to these cocktail parties or these fancy dinners as much. He started doing 500 push-ups a day. And he started uh, getting into like health stuff. I got him into health podcasts. And he has lost, I think, either 30 or 35 pounds since he quit drinking. This is someone who was only drinking two or three glasses of wine, <clears throat> excuse me, two or three times a week. So it's kind of amazing. And he went to a wine tasting recently and I asked him how it was. And he said, I tried it, but it all tasted like crap. Like, I, I can't believe I ever liked that stuff. And then uh, he said, I also realized I've been saving like three or $4,000 a year by not drinking. So why the hell would I start drinking? And then I'm not gonna be able to do my push-ups. It's like, I don't have time for alcohol. So if a social drinker can transcend alcohol, then anyone who has much more of a reason to do it can definitely do it as well. I did want to toot my own horn real quick. Total Alcohol Recovery 2.0 is my online course. We recently opened a private Facebook group for it. Uh, we've had almost 400 people go through the course. I want the Fit Recovery community to, be, to revolve around this course going forward. So if you are interested in learning more about nutrient repair, about diet, about holistic strategies, there's a lot of stuff in there. And it is completely open-ended. So we have people in the Facebook group sharing things written by um, all these people who in any other, I think, industry, I would think of as a competitor. But I'm like, no, bring it all in and we're gonna fit all the puzzle pieces together. So with that said, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this little talk despite my little fog in the throat. And I wanna open it up for Q&A.